The Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 8, if you will please. And we'll begin our reading in just a moment, verse number 19. Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 19. We are continuing our study in the book of Luke, and I have greatly enjoyed it. The book of Luke is the longest book in the New Testament. It expands on many of the things that the other gospel records tell us and gives us more detail. Luke was a physician, and he's very detail-oriented, and he gives many accounts of things that took place, and uh, he gives it in such a detail that we can learn some amazing truths from it. And I pray that God will do that this morning. If you will, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 8, will begin in verse number 19. We have a story here that I have not in my life heard very much on. I've read it, and, uh, but I had to ask the Lord to give some understanding, some wisdom about it. Luke chapter 8, verse number 19, the Bible says, Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. This morning I would like to give a message on the theme, What is the true family of God? What is the true family of God? The physical family of Christ shows up wanting to see Him. And I don't think that he was being disrespectful or saying, I don't want to see them. But he wanted to teach a truth about those who are a part of the family of God. I love that song that I've sung for years, and you've probably sung it longer. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. But how do you become part of that family? And I want to speak on that for a moment. What is the true family of God? Let's pray for the message. Father, as we come to you in prayer, we are aware of our need of you. Lord, I realize, we all realize, that we are unable, utterly unable, to accomplish anything on our own power, our own merit, our own strength. But we desperately need the Lord. I pray that you would take over my mind and heart, and not just mine, but all of our minds and hearts that we may be receptive and obedient to the words that the Lord will speak. And Father, may you take every word that's spoken, may be used for your glory. And once again, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Christ, may they become part of the family of God today. And for every Christian that's here, use this message that you are bringing to your own family. And use it in each of our lives. We truly love you and we truly thank you for your goodness and your death, burial, and resurrection for our sin. We ask now, Father, that you would remove distraction from our minds, that you would cleanse our hearts and our minds, that we may receive all that is ours to receive. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What a great story we find here of how Jesus is speaking to those who are listening to Him. He's speaking to His disciples and all of a sudden His mother and His brethren, meaning His physical, biological family members, show up at the door and they say, we want to speak to Him. And they get somebody's attention And the other gospel records give us other details of the story as well. That they get someone's attention and that person comes to Jesus and says, Do you know that your family members are outside the door wanting to have a conversation with you? Now I've always been intrigued by this story and I don't think I fully understood the impact of it 
the meaning of it until the Lord spoke to me as I was studying this. To understand what has happened when you're preaching the Word of God, and if you're a preacher, you understand this, that if you're preaching the Word of God, you cannot just skip over something because it's not easy to understand. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, he says that I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. God's will for the preacher is not to preach bits and pieces that he finds easy to preach, but to preach the whole entire counsel of God. That means he's to preach every book of the Bible. He's to preach Song of Solomon. Don't hear that very often. He is to preach everything in God's Word. He is to preach the truths that are found in God's Word. That's what the preacher's job is. That's his calling. And when we come to this, we cannot skip over it. We cannot think that maybe there's no latent meaning. That it's just what meets the eye on the surface. But I would suggest to you that like a giant iceberg, the Word of God, what you see on the top, only is a hint at all that is underneath. That God's Word is something of great depth. It's something of great meaning. It's something of great treasure. It's like a cavernous hole that you can just explore for years and years and years. And some of you have been doing this a lot longer than me. Some of you have been around longer than I have. And you've been exploring those cavernous depths for a long time. But in a few years, and by the way, we've all only really lived a few years. But in the few years that, that I've had and that we've had, if, if, and oh, what a big if. If you are intentionally exploring God's Word, that you'll find that it's greater than the Loray Cavern. It's greater than any caverns you can find anywhere or any great labyrinth that you'll find underneath the ground somewhere because God's Word is not only a great mine and depth of truth, but it is an infinite treasure trove of God's truth. That's what the Bible is. And what I'm trying to say to you in this introduction to the message is I just want to whet your appetite. That's all. I just want to whet your appetite for God's Word because what I can say in a 40-minute message or however long it may go, don't talk about how long it goes. <laughs> but what I can say in that amount of time is still only the surface. It's still only that which is visible. But there's so much that in some ways is invisible. There's so much that God, by His Spirit, has to reveal to us as we read God's Word. And I encourage you, don't just get your sustenance from what the preacher says. Don't just get your sustenance from what you read in your dual daily bread book that you read in the mornings. But get your sustenance from God's holy, wonderful, precious Word every day of your life. Don't let a single day go by in your life where you do not mine the depths of Scripture. And when you do not look at the Scriptures that you've read and meditate on them and uh, think about them and, and, and consider how God is speaking to your heart. Don't ever just read it just to read it just like you would read Shakespeare or just like you would read a novel. But take God's Word and realize God's book is like no other book. I said it's like no other book. There's no book in the world <laughs> that can minister to you again and again and again. For those of you who've been here as long as I've been pastor here, you'll know that I've very rarely ever given allusion to movies in my sermons. In fact, this is probably the first time I've ever done it. Here's what I want to say to you. When I watch a movie, my wife could corroborate this. When I watch a movie, once I've watched it once, I'm good. Anybody else like that? Okay, how many of you like to watch the same thing ten times? Wow, that's a majority of you. But I watch it once, and most of the time I say I'm good. 
And my wife says, do you want to watch this movie? And I say, well, have we watched it before? Yes, well, let's do something else, you know. And that's just the way I am. But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how many times I've read God's Word again and again. Not only, not only does it speak to, you, to me in a new way every time, but guess what? Every time that I read it, it's better than it was the last time. I'm serious. It's better than it was the last time. It's not only just the same. Where I look at it, I say, oh wow, that reminds me how wonderful that was. But no, I look at it and I say, oh wow, there's something in it that I never, ever saw before. That's what the Bible is. And when we read this passage about the mother and the brethren of Jesus coming to speak with Him, I saw some things that I'd never seen before, and I would never have seen that unless I took the time to meditate on it. To meditate. Let me give you one more challenge, and then we'll see, see the message we have today. That when you read the Bible, always, always, do your best to take the time to meditate on some truth you've read. You know, sometimes... You may read a chapter and one or two things stand out. At least pick one thing. And it may be good to meditate when you go to bed at night. Or when you get up in the morning. To meditate on God's Word. And what He's speaking to you about. And think about that truth. Let it govern your life. Let it change your life. Let it mold your thinking. Because the truth of the matter is, a lot of things can mold our thinking. A lot of things. And speaking of movies, since I already brought it up, might as well say it again. They can mold your thinking. That's true. Especially when you watch them at a young age, you can look at it and you can start thinking a certain way because of something you saw on a movie. I won't give any illustrations of people that I've met that have showed me that. They've demonstrated that. That it can mold your thinking. A lot of things can mold your thinking. People your friends can mold your thinking. The people you hang around with can mold your thinking. The books you read, I have some authors that I love. And I use the word love appropriately because I truly do love to read those people. And they minister to my soul. But it has to come underneath the umbrella of the authority of God's Word. It has to come under that umbrella. And I love reading those, but I must let the Word of God mold my thinking. There's a lot of people out there writing a lot of things. A lot of books. A lot of people with a lot of ideas. A lot of theologians. But I have one question. Not what does Mr. Dr. So-and-so have to say. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And with that being said, we have this question before us today. What is the true family of God? And I don't know about you, but that's all I want to be part of. It's the family of God. Now, I have a wonderful family that I'll be seeing in a few days. I'm thankful for my family. They all love God. They're all living for God. I'm thankful for them. But I'm not with them very often. But I am with the family of God every week. I am with the family of God every week. And it is imperative that every one of us have three homes. Three homes. You have the home where your family is, you have a church home, and you need to have a heavenly home. A heavenly home. If you know Christ, then you have a heavenly home. But the family of God is a family that can encourage you. The family of God is a family that can uplift you and edify you and help you to become all that God wants you to be. I was speaking to a person the other day and they said, well, you know what? Since COVID, by the way, what is COVID? That hadn't been around in a while. And they said, well, since COVID, I've been watching at home. Well, I just want to tell you something. If I want to see my family... We don't just get on a Zoom call. We go drive and see one another. If you want to be with God's family and you want to have all the benefits that come with God's family, you'll have to take those 15 minutes and drive 
those 30 minutes and drive to church and be with God's family. Because you don't have that benefit any other way. You can't get it virtually. Can't happen. Can't happen. I speak to people virtually almost every day of my life, it seems, nowadays. All the time, I speak to people virtually. But you know what? They all recognize, and I recognize. You know how wonderful it would be if I could see you in the face? How much better that would be? And listen, any kind of a virtual meeting is never going to substitute because the truth of the matter is, hey, listen, you may be able to hear a message virtually. It still doesn't have the same power. But you may see certain things and hear certain things virtually, but you cannot, you cannot, you absolutely cannot experience the family of God virtually. It just can't happen. And we're talking about the family of God. What is the true family of God? The Bible says here in verse number I'm in the wrong chapter. My page turned. <laughs> Verse number 19. They came to him, his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. Now, I want to give you three basic things, and we'll be finished. Number one, if you write this down, please. The family of God does not contain everyone in the world. It doesn't. Unfortunately, I said, unfortunately, many people think that we're all the children of God. We're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, so we're all the children of God. I spoke to someone the other day who said, oh yeah, we're all brothers and sisters because we're all part of the same family. We're just, everyone's the children of God. Well, if you're a Christian, you are. But it doesn't go beyond that. In fact, Jesus said, and I didn't say it, Jesus said it, that if you're not a child of God, you're a child of the devil. And that's what he said. He said to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. That's quite a statement. And the deeds of your father ye will do. And so we look around and we wonder why the perversity? Why the depravity? Why the dissolute wickedness? And why the behavior? Because the deeds of your father, you will do. When you're a child of the devil, you will do the things the devil does. When you're a child of God, you'll be different. You're not going to be perfect, but you will strive to be like your father. The deeds of your father, you will do. We're not all the children of God. If you don't know Christ, you're not a child of God. Now let's learn, how does this happen? Keep your finger there, please, and turn with me to the Gospel according to John. The Gospel according to John, chapter number 1. In verse 11. John, chapter 1, verse 11. It says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. And then verse 12. I've always loved this verse. John 1, 12. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on His name. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Bible says, no, not everyone's a child of God, but as many as received Him. To them He gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Only those who know Christ as Savior, only those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ into their life, only those people are the children of God. Only those people. And they believe on the name of the Son of God. Amen. It is simply not true that every human being is a child of God. It's just not true. We've all been created by God. It would do us all a great deal of good just to recognize that truth. That we've all been created by God. But just because you're created by God doesn't mean you are a child of God. You're only a child of God 
if you've received Jesus Christ by faith as Savior, and if you have believed on His name, that is the only way you could ever become a child of God. That's it. That's it. Many want admittance into the family, but are not willing to be properly instated. They want admittance. They want to be. They say, oh, oh, yeah, I want to be part of that family. With God as the Father, I want to be part of that family. You'd be pretty strange if you didn't want to be. I want to be part of that family, but they don't want to be properly instated. Now, here's the question, all right? Here's the question. How do you get into the family of God? Because, listen, we are not naturally born into the family. We are naturally born sinners. We're naturally born enemies of God. The Bible says we're at enmity with God. We're enemies of God. We're naturally born as a child of the devil. We're not a child of God at birth. We're innately, we're inveterately and habitually a child of sin and a child of the devil. That's the way we're born. So how in the world do we become part of this family? Well, listen, what happens when we receive Christ as Savior and believe in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you get something called adopted. Amen. You get adopted into that family. You get adopted. I heard a preacher one time. And he preached a message called, Are We Born Again or Adopted? Well, the answer is yes. We've been adopted, and the wonderful thing about being adopted in the God's family is you do get regenerated and reborn when you're adopted. So now you are a child of that family, a child of God. But you see, we have to be adopted into God's family. You have to be adopted. And when you're adopted in God's family, you inherit all of the benefits, all of the joys, all of the wonderful things that comes with being part of that family. You are adopted. You see, John 3, verse 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. You cannot be part of God's family unless you're born of the Spirit. You cannot be God, part of God's family unless you are made new, a new creature in Christ, by being born again. That's the only way you can be part of God's family. That's what he says. That which is born of the Spirit of the Spirit. Marvel not that I said to you must be born again. Not just born of water, but of the Spirit. Otherwise you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. Born again. You see, the Bible speaks. Look at one passage with me, please. Turn over to Romans chapter number 8. And we must see this. Because Romans chapter number 8 speaks about the adoption that we have in Christ. How that we have been adopted into the family of God. Romans chapter 8, in uh, beginning please, in uh, verse number 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, the Bible says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If you're a child of God, you know it. Because the Holy Spirit, praise God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Verse 17, this is where it gets good. Really good. Because he says in verse 17, and if children, then what's that next word? What is it? Heirs. heirs. Do you know what an heir is? An heir is someone who is entitled to all of the goods and possessions of his father. Do you hear that? All the goods and the possessions. This is what we have in Christ. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Just like Christ is the Son of God, and He's the heir of all things, we are joint heirs with Him. Just like Christ is the heir, we are just the same. We are heirs with Christ of everything that the Father possesses. Just think about it. Just let it ruminate in your mind. Just think about it. Everything God has is yours. Through Christ. Through Christ. Everything you have 
Everything God has, He has, what has He done? He's bequeathed that to you because of Christ. We won't turn to these other passages. I'll mention them to you and we'll move on. The, adoptions of son, the adoption of sons is mentioned in Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7. You can look on your own time sometime. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 talks about the adoption of sons, the adoption, the adoption of children. And Ephesians chapter 1 says, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. We have been through Christ. Not through our works or through anything I can do or through some religion that I follow or something that I do for God, but because of Christ and because through faith in Christ I've become a Christian and I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. Because of that, I am accepted into the family of God. I'm just trying to get you happy about this. Because I've been accepted into the Beloved. I've been part of that family. I've been accepted. You know, some people have a hard time. And I spent years in my life, let me say this, we move on to our next point quickly. I spent years of my life trying to be accepted by other people. Trying to be accepted. You know what I did? I tried to be a different person. Because people didn't like me the way I was. They still probably don't, but it doesn't matter to me anymore. Because listen, it doesn't really matter if people accept me. I've already been accepted. I've already been accepted into the family of God. It doesn't matter if others accept me for who I am or they just accept me because of something. He's already accepted me. I'm accepted in the beloved. And by the way, when we get to heaven, all the different attitudes about class and station in life and this person attained to this, this person didn't, this person's weird, this person whatever, all that will be gone. So by the way, whoever you don't like, whoever you think is weird, hey listen, you're going to spend all eternity with that person, you might as well love them now. Because they're a child of God. If they know Christ is their Savior, they're a child of God. And I'm not here to purport to tell you that somehow I like every person. I'm not saying that. We all have our struggles. We all have the time to say, I don't really want to talk to this person. But let me tell you what. You have no authentic, reasonable reason to not love that person. Because God's already accepted them. And if God's accepted them, so should you. So should you. The family of God does not... Con does not contain everyone in the world. Secondly, the family of God does not consist simply of those who desire to be in the family. The kingdom of God, or excuse me, the family of God does not consist simply of those who desire to be in the family. Let's look at what he says here. And uh, let's see what the Bible says. You say, you're just pulling these points out of nowhere? No. The Bible says it. And uh, back in our passage in Luke chapter 8, in verse 19, Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. You see, his mother and his brethren, they desired to see him. They wanted to be near him. They wanted to be with him. But desiring to see is not the same as being part of. You may desire something, you may desire, desire to see something, but that doesn't mean it actually happened. I desire to see the Himalayan mountains. You ever seen them, brother? I hope I can one day. The Himalayan mountains. I love to see the Himalayan mountains. I don't think I'll ever climb Mount Everest. I think I'd make it about a 32nd of the way up and be done. I just say that's what the phone is for. Just take a picture of it all. <laughs> I want to get up there, you know. I love to see it. But just because I desire to see it doesn't mean I've ever actually been there. I can make up all these fantastic images in my mind of what I think it looks like. I can watch documentaries. I can look at pictures and have an idea what it's like. But it's not the same as being there. And just because I desire it doesn't mean 
that I'm actually part of it. And there are many who desire the kingdom of God. I've spoken to people and they say, yeah, I'm getting closer. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's right. But they've never actually made the step of repenting of their sins and receiving Christ as their Savior. So they're not part of it. They're looking from the outside. And the family of God is not like uh, something where you can just window shop. It's not something where you can just look out in and say, man, I, I, I do want that. You cannot just desire it and still be entitled to all that the Christians have, but then keep Christ at a distance. You can't just keep Christ at a distance. And here's the point I want to make about this, because so many people think, they think, yeah, I know who Christ is. I know who He is. You know how many people know who Christ is? Billions of people. Because Christ made sure that His gospel was preached everywhere. Many people know about Christ. And they might even want to have something of Him. But they don't have it unless they're actually part of the family. You can't get to heaven by a head knowledge. It has to be the heart knowledge where He lives inside of us. The head knowledge is not enough. You are not part of the family because you know things about Christ or the Bible. That doesn't make you part of the family. Lots of people that know all kinds of stuff about the Bible, but that doesn't make them part of God's family. You may be a smart person, you may know all things about history and so on, but it doesn't make you part of the family of God. You can only become part of the family of God if you go by the way of the cross, the only way you can be instated with all the benefits fully into the family of God is by walking by the way of the cross of Jesus Christ. And through that cross, when you come to know Christ, you repent of your sin and receive Him as Savior, then and only then, do you become a joint heir with Christ? Amen. Everything that God has given you, it only comes as you believe in Christ and receive Him. Then you become a joint heir. Because you know what? Christ, the Bible says, was made like unto His brethren. So we are joint heirs with Christ. We are heirs of God. Christ is an heir of God and we're an heir of God. So that means we're joint heirs with Christ. That's why in Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 17, it says it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a, a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Jesus Christ was made like unto his brethren because he knew that we would be his brethren. So what did he do? He took on flesh. He took on humanity. He took on all of the... Not the sinful nature, but the human nature. And the problems of the human nature, of the hunger and the thirst, and all the pain, and all those things. He experienced it all in full magnitude. He experienced it. And he experienced the temptations. But he didn't have the sinful nature. That's the difference. He didn't have the sinful nature. So he became like unto his brethren. And therefore, we can become an heir of Christ. An heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. So the family of God does not just exist of the people who want it, but those who received Him. And then lastly, you said, well, you spend this whole time talking about what it's not. Well, let me tell you what it is. The family of God is comprised of those who hear the Word of God and do it. The family of God is comprised of those that hear the Word of God and do it. Look what he says in verse 21. After they said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My, my mother and my brethren are these that hear the Word of God and do it. That's the family of God. 
They said, your mother and brethren are without. They're desiring to see you. But Jesus said, he looks around, he stretches out his hand, he says, see these right here in front of me? These are my family. See all of you out there that are following God and His Word? He said, those are my family. Those belong to me. And we won't turn there for uh, the sake of our time today, but in Matthew chapter 12, we have the same story. But there, but there, the Lord Jesus says, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? That's what He said. Who are my mother who are my brethren? And He stretched forth His hand toward His disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. He said that about His disciples that were sitting in front of Him and listening to Him and hanging on every word and just taking in everything that He was saying. He said, Behold, look, my mother and my brethren. These disciples were the true family. And then don't miss this, because it says in Matthew 12, Whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven. My Father. Hey, listen, if we say God's our Father, how many of you have a Heavenly Father? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Amen. Have a Heavenly Father. Are you doing His will? He says, that's the true family. Those who are doing the will of of my Father which is in heaven. That's what Jesus said. And then in Mark 3, when we have a similar account, Jesus says, Whosoever whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. This is the true family of God. Those who seek God's will, not their own. And this happens by knowing Christ as Savior, and as you know Christ, then you by the Spirit of God can know what God's will is. Now, let me be clear. The Bible tells us we're born again, we receive Christ, and we be immediately become the family of God. So, anyone who knows Christ is part of the family of God. But let me ask you this question. And let me say it in kind of a rhetorical statement first. Just because you're part of the family doesn't mean you act like you're part of the family. Think about that. Because the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of people who have a family, but they don't act anything like they're part of that family. They disappoint everybody in the family, and they disappoint their father, disappoint their mother. They don't act like it. Did you know, I'm saying this and we're closing today. Please give your undivided attention. I want you to think about this application. If you are a part of the family of God, do you act as a child of God should act? Are you acting like you're part of that family? Because there are many who claim to be part of the family, but guess what? They're not doing the will of the Father. They have the audacity. They have the audacity to say they're a child of God, but they don't care about God's will for their life. And if you want to sit there and say, I'm part of God's family, are you acting like it? Are you acting like it? Are you doing the will of your Father which is in heaven? Those in the true family of God desire to do the will of His Father because Jesus said, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. In closing, you've heard the word of God today. And I hope and pray that we hear it every Sunday. I hope you hear it every day. As God is speaking to you. But are you doing it? What God has said to you? Are you following? Are you obeying God's will? This is very important. 
Because you have to make a choice. You may be 12 years old, or you may be 72 years old. But you have to make a choice. Some people make it when they're 80 years old. Some people make it when they're 3 years old. But you have to make a choice to say, because I'm part of the family of God, I'm not just going to presume that I can enjoy all the benefits and act however I want like the prodigal son. Or act however I want, like some stray child. But because I'm part of the family of God, and because I'm already an heir with Christ, amen? I'm a joint heir. And if I'm a joint heir, I want to act like it. I want to act like I'm a part of that family. So the question is this, what is his will? Is he pointing things out in your life? Say, this is my will for you. If you're part of his family, that's the path you ought to take. Because it's His will. This is the true family of God. Would you bow in prayer with me, please?